going to continue our study of what is spirit. Last time we closed with that, that we see from Scripture that God is spirit, but what is spirit? Because in John 4.24, Jesus said we were to worship God in spirit because he is spirit. We saw that spirit is invisible, immaterial, spaceless, immortal. Invisible, if you can see it, it isn't spirit, obviously, except on those rare occasions when spirit takes on form temporarily, like an angel appearing. Immaterial, you can divide material things up into parts, individual bits, but spirit is the essence, and you can't go any higher or lower or reduce it to any other form, so it's immaterial. We said it's spaceless. Even the smallest molecule or atom has a certain amount of spread, occupies space. God created space when he created the universe. In fact, he created space first, or it had no place to put the objects. The galaxies are you, for that matter. And then we said, spirit is immortal. Since you can't reduce spirit to anything else, since you can't divide it, you can't destroy it, it's immortal. Now, we weren't just describing God. We were answering the question, what is spirit? But Jesus said, God is spirit. So we want to just pick up where we left off last time. We were dealing with immortality and its relationship to time. And we said the time was created when the universe was created. Now tonight I want to deal with some terms, first of all, still under the heading, God is spirit and what is spirit. Now the term spirit is used in various ways in both the Old and New Testaments. Since this is New Testament theology, we base most of what we're showing you on that, but Sometimes it helps to see or remind yourself what the whole revelation has to say. First of all, in the Old Testament, we'll say a few words. Spirit in the Old Testament is used in a figurative way. Figurative way. Spirit can describe disposition, attitude, character. The Old Testament speaks, for example, of a spirit of anger, you see, disposition. Moses was meek in spirit. Character, perverse spirits are spoken of. For example, in Proverbs 16, 18, and 19. Now this will help you to understand what we'll say about the New Testament. So Proverbs 16, 18, and 19 shows that spirit can be used in this figurative way. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So there you can see that spirit can be used in the sense of a haughty spirit or a meek spirit or a humble spirit in a figurative way. Now that's just by way of illustration. Of course, we could multiply that scores of times. Now, spirit also in the Old Testament... We're asking, what is spirit? Spirit is personality. Spirit can be a personality. For example, God made his angels spirits. Psalm 104 and verse 4. And you know angels as personalities. He made his angels spirits. So when you see an angel, you're not seeing a soul or a human, nor God. You're seeing a spirit. That's King James, and the ASV is incorrect, and New American Standard is incorrect in their translation of that. They have a ridiculous translation, so stay with King James on that, because it's the Hebrew. And then the Bible speaks of evil spirits as personalities. For example, in 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 to 16, verse 23, God, we're told, sent an evil spirit to trouble Saul because of his disobedience. And then over in 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23, the evil spirit there is identified as a lying spirit, which obviously means it must be a personality because just some intangible general 
force could not be characterized as being able to tell lies. Then a third way that spirit is used in the Old Testament is in relation to the body and soul. And we studied all this, by the way, in Old Testament theology, so we're not going to go into that. But when you relate spirit to the body and soul, you find out that the spirit, in contrast to body and soul, is the principle of conscious life. The spirit is the principle of conscious life, sometimes equated with the breath. Like in Genesis 2, 7, God created man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, which was spirit, of course, and man became a living soul. He doesn't have a soul. He is a soul, according to the Scripture. Not just Genesis 2, 7, but all through the Old Testament. Remember, soul is often translated as persons, and persons sometimes is translated as souls. The term nephish, by the way, in the Old Testament means person in life. Spirit in the Old Testament is the vital principle which animates the body. It's the vital force or principle which animates his body. He's nothing until he gets spirit and then he becomes soul. The body plus spirit equals soul. We taught you all that in Old Testament. And so spirit in the Old Testament is the incorporeal part of man. The term for spirit in the Old Testament, as you remember, is ruach, R-U-A-C-H. And that term is translated spirit in Genesis 41.8. Genesis 41.8, and it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, speaking of Pharaoh. And then it's translated as wind in Genesis 8 and verse 1, the same term, ruach. This is just a little background for what we'll say in the New Testament conception. In fact, you need this to understand that the New didn't change a thing. A lot of people got some Greek ideas, but the New Testament writers were Jews, and they stayed with the Old Testament conception of ruach, or if you prefer, ruach. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him and the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. Now, the word wind, term wind, is ruach. It could have been translated spirit, but you see, it wouldn't have made sense. And sometimes it doesn't make sense the way it's translated. And the reason for that is you've got different translators for practically every book in the Bible, whatever version you use. There's no consistency whatever. The person who translated 1 Timothy probably did translate 2 Timothy because you need a little consistency in 1st and 2nds, don't you? <laughs> but whoever translated Mark didn't translate John. And you can just see the hand of the different translators in the versions. And while we're on the subject, the New American Standard is just about as bad as the RSV. Oh, it's terrible. I'm almost done with it. I read it from the first word all the way through, and I know enough Hebrew and Greek to know where they're missing it without having to look it up. Sometimes I look it up, and it's pathetic. Well, anyway, breath in 6.17. It's translated a third way, and can be. Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the ruach of life, the breath of life. And it does mean all of those things just as the New Testament conception. And so you have to stay with context, you have to be an honest translator, and you have to know the languages to do justice to terms that can mean so many things. But of course, the spirit being invisible, you can see how breath or wind could be interchangeable sometimes, even with that. If they translated it that way, sometimes it might be all right. We're talking about, thirdly, how spirit is used in relation to soul. Soul is nephesh. N-E-P-H-E-S-H. -E -E soul is nephesh in the Old Testament. In relation to soul, or nephesh, generally, as we saw in Old Testament theology, nephesh denotes the individual himself as a person. 
whereas Ruach, our spirit, signifies the animating principle or the vital force within the individual. He is so, but he has a spirit. Now, I'm stressing within because that's the way the Old Testament presents it. You can't interchange nephesh and spirit, though on occasion it can be done if you understand what's happening. But anyway, the nephesh is the person himself. And the spirit is the vital force which gives life, which is within him, which makes him a nephesh, a soul, living soul. Now, I want to give you scriptures. Genesis 2-7, which we've already quoted. In the Hebrew, it's soul, nephesh. God created man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living nephesh, soul. He doesn't have a soul. He is the soul. But it's when he gets the spirit. And then over in Genesis 46, verses 26 and 27, we read, And all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were three score and six. Well, you know he's not talking about souls. He's talking about persons who went down to Egypt. And it should have been translated that way. And the sons of Joseph, which were born to him in Egypt, were two souls. And all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten souls. There you see that soul is the person. But take with that other passages that show spirit is not the person. Man has spirit. He is soul. That's Job 32.8. The spirit in relation to the soul shows that soul is the person. The spirit is what he has which makes him a person when in relation to his body. All right, Job 32 and verse 8. But there is a spirit in man. Now where is it? In man. He didn't say there's a soul in man, but man is soul. Then down in verse 18, likewise, For I am full of matter. The spirit within me constrains me. See, the spirit, when it's spoken of, is within us. And the same thing is said over in Psalm 143 and verse 4. We don't have to look it up. The spirit is within man. In passing, if you want to just add it to your notes, nephesh, our soul, can also signify in the Old Testament the seat of the appetites and desires. That's Deuteronomy 12, 20. Of course, you have to read it in the Hebrew to know that nephesh is used there, but he speaks of what they desired to eat. Their souls lusted after quail and so forth, you know, and God fed them. So the soul is the seed of the appetites and desires. It's the seed of the emotions, Jeremiah 13, 17. Jeremiah's soul wept. He wept with his soul. And sometimes nephesh, our soul, signifies life itself. Like Leviticus 17, 11, the life is in the blood. It's translated life, but it's the word nephesh. Then in Genesis 35, 18, it's again translated soul there. Although it should be translated life, I think it's as she died, her soul left her. Well, it should have been translated her life left her because nephesh can mean life. But there it's not the life that we just described as the spirit being the vital force, but it's simply life in a general sense. If you wanted to write something in Hebrew, if you were a Jew and you wanted to speak of the life, you could use nephesh. But if you want to talk about what was within man that gave him life, it would be ruach, or spirit. Now, that brings us, with that background, to the New Testament. Now, the New Testament term for spirit is pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. P-N-E-U-M-A. Pneuma. Spirit. And just as in the Old Testament, it also is used in various ways. Principally, those that we gave you for the Old Testament is translated as spirit, then as wind, and then as breath, just like the Old Testament. Remember, the Jews wrote 
the New Testament. They weren't Greek. It's translated as spirit in Hebrews 12, 23, Penuma. The spirits of just men made perfect. It's translated as wind in John 3, 8. Jesus said the spirit is like the wind blowing in the tree. It's translated there as wind. By the way, in John 3, it's translated both as spirit and wind in the same passage. Then Penuma, our spirit, is translated as breath in 2 Thessalonians 2.8, where Paul says Jesus will destroy Antichrist. Literally, he said, with the spirit of his mouth, which would have been a better translation. But in King James, it's translated breath of his mouth. I don't know what your later versions would say, but what Jesus will do is not destroy Antichrist with the breath of his mouth, which doesn't make a lot of sense unless you think of breath as words and you get into analogies. But what he said, what the Spirit said through Paul, Jesus will destroy Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth. Now, that makes things sound a little more realistic as well as powerful. Now, Spirit in the New Testament can be used just like in the Old. It can be used figuratively, first of all. We read in 1 Peter 3, 4 of a meek and quiet panuma, spirit. So it can be used figuratively as disposition and attitude and so forth. Meek and quiet spirit, speaking of wives who win their husbands. She has a meek and quiet panuma. Secondly, Spirit in the New Testament is used, just like in the Old, of personality. Angels are spirits, Hebrews 1, 4, and 14. Now you've read that. He maketh his angels spirits, and his angels are the spirits that help the saints. Angels are spirits. And just like in the Old, demons are evil spirits. Many examples, Luke 8 and verse 2, a demon is called an evil spirit. Thirdly, just like in the Old Testament, you can use spirit in relation to body and soul. Just like in the Old Testament, spirit in the New is the vital life principle. It's the principle of conscious life, the vital force that gives life. Without spirit, there'd be no life. You wouldn't have soul without spirit. The person, of course, is a combination of body and soul. That's why the resurrection is promised. There is no such thing as a soul floating around. It's the immaterial part of the personality, and he needs a body to house it. He'll get a new one if he's a Christian, of course. So in relation, it's the same. It's the vital principle of life. For example, in Luke 8.55, when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, we're told the spirit came back into her body and she came to life. You see, the spirit was gone, so no life. You say, well, where's the soul if there's no life? Well, there isn't a soul, it's a person. And all of that is covered in much detail in Old Testament studies, Old Testament theology. We just said it. The person is incomplete without a body. That's why he's promised one in the resurrection. Paul had a desire to be with Christ, but he didn't particularly like the idea of not having a body. And only those who don't have bodies could explain that to you. The saints awaiting the resurrection want their bodies because they're not spirits. Spirits don't need bodies. But we are souls with spirit the life-giving Spirit of God. So we need bodies, and that is the gospel. Read it for yourself, 1 Corinthians 15. If there be no resurrection, he says, there is no gospel. That is the gospel. What do you promise people when you witness to them? You promise them a good seat in faith assembly where you can really get blessed? Get your bills paid and your needs met and healed when you're sick? Oh, those are just things that go along with being a Christian. Of course, I recognize people are not taught that, so they don't appropriate their inheritance. The promises for over here, most of them. But what are you witnessing to them about? The hope of the resurrection of the body, eternal life with Jesus. Not some vague notion of all going back into the universal, absolute 
you can call God or whatever. So in Luke 8.55, it's the Spirit that gave her life because it was gone. When the Spirit came back into her body, she was restored to life. And there's a clear distinction between spirit and soul and, of course, body all through the New Testament like the Old. Like 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Hebrews 4.12, spirit and soul are clearly distinguished. You can't have them distinguished in the same verse if they're the same. I pray, God, your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved in the day of Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Well, you know your body is different from your soul and spirit. And so he could have simply said, I pray that the whole man be preserved. Now, in the New Testament, the concept of the soul, like we saw in the Old Testament, we show the distinction. And the soul in the Greek is psuche, P-S-U-C-H, long E. So in the New Testament, the psuche concept is not Greek but Hebrew, as we've already said. Exactly like in the Old Testament, you'll find the New Testament using the soul in the same way. as the person most of the time. That's what it stands for. Sometimes life. For example, in Acts 27, 37, Paul speaks of 276 pesukes on board. Translated souls. I don't know why they ever did. Of course, it is literally the word for soul, but it should have been translated person because basically that's what it means most of the time. So you can read it for yourself, Acts 27, 37. In fact, your later versions may translate it persons. But your later versions are just, most of them, so poor that I don't recommend them. If you've got to look it up anyway, you might as well have the King James. That's the one I still stay with. It's pathetic, some of the translations in the ASV and NASV, although the ASV is, for study purposes, not too bad most of the time. Then in Mark 3, 4, Jesus asked, Is it lawful to save a soul or kill on the Sabbath? But you'll notice it's translated life. Is it lawful to take a life? or to save a life on the Sabbath. Well, he's talking about the person, isn't he? But it's the soul in the Greek. In Matthew 16, 26, he speaks of the person himself when he asks that familiar phrase that you've heard so many times, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, he's simply asking, what will a man give in exchange for himself, his life, his eternal being? Not soul as some Greek concept that it's something that can fly away when the body dies. In fact, in the previous verse, verse 25, the same word, psuche, is translated as life. Then in Matthew 10, 28, in 1 Peter 2, 11, in Revelation 6, 9, if you read the passages, you'll see, obviously, he's talking about persons, not souls as something immaterial and indescribable, but simply the incorporeal or immaterial aspect of personality, which is incomplete until it gets another body. See, if God had wanted us to be spirits, he'd have made us that way. And, of course, we recognize visitors come in and people who haven't sat under the teaching, the plain teaching of the Word of God. And, of course, you do yourself a disservice if you just jump to conclusions and run out and say, well, they teach that man doesn't have a soul. And you would be right, but you ought to say it in the right context. Man doesn't have a soul, he is a soul. And over and over and over, not like once or twice and you build a doctrine on it, but all through Old and New Testament, well, just like we read Paul in Acts 27, 37. There are 270 souls on board. Should have been translated persons, and often is. You know, there's no consistency, and I've already told you why. The fellow who translated Acts didn't translate some other book. And so it's whatever they wanted to do. Sometimes they'll translate it life or person or just soul. I don't know how else you can do it except to get one person translate the whole Bible because you can see the differences in translations, and the buts and the ands and the fors are just a mess of confusion. 
they'll say but when they should have said and or for, and it just leaves a wrong emphasis. And NASV is a very poor translation, both Old and New Testament, because when you can read the Greek and the Hebrew, you can make that statement. So don't sit out there, anybody, and say, what's he know about it? Well, it's because I've studied about as much Greek as you can stand, and I taught Hebrew. So my point is this. If you're a slave to the Greek preposition or article to the point that where you have to look it up in the dictionary of grammar and you can't translate sense, then you leave wrong impressions sometimes. Well, enough of that. But anyway, there are a lot of ands and buts and fors that should have been one or the other in that particular verse or context. That's just a little thing. They do a pathetic job on some verses, like the one I cited. Something else about spirit. Let's get back to spirit. Spirit, or pneuma, denotes the immaterial part of man's personality. Now, we didn't say the immaterial part of man, but of his personality, as is clearly seen in 2 Corinthians 7.1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, what did he say? Let's cleanse ourselves completely. That's all he's saying, in and out, inside, outside. Our bodies, our spirits, cleanse ourselves. So spirit, you see there, is equated with the immaterial part of personality. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, 18, he could have just said, I. It's the word for spirit. Could have been translated, I, or Paul could have said, I. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 18. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. That could easily have been translated, they have refreshed me. But what he's saying there, he's saying, my innermost being, to say that a person grieved your spirit has more force than just saying, well, he grieved me, or to rejoice in the spirit has more force than just saying, I rejoiced. And that's often why it's used. What I'm saying is that sometimes that the spirit itself can stand for the person but in a way that is obvious, like here. It's no problem at all to see. He could have said, you refresh me. You see, once you have the Spirit, you can't take it out and look at it and analyze it. It's simply the life principle where God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. He takes body, adds spirit, and you end up with soul. And that's the person. And it's the way it's translated again and again in both Testaments. But sometimes the Spirit, which is something that's added, so you don't become Spirit, you have Spirit from God. You can see sometimes it can be an obvious synonym for person. Which brings me to the final statement on spirit, that when the Old and New Testaments address themselves to the deceased, that these terms again sometimes are used almost interchangeably. That is, they can say either of the deceased, that he is soul, or that he is spirit. For example, in Revelation 6, 9, John saw the souls of the martyrs under the altar. Now, he didn't see souls because what is a soul that you can see? What shape is it? How much does it weigh? What color? That should have been translated, he saw the persons. Because obviously they're in heaven. It's all right to say soul if you know it always, or generally always, and in this context would mean person. And then in Hebrews 12, 23, the deceased are not called souls, but in that passage called spirits. The spirits of just men made perfect. Could have been translated, he saw the saints in heaven. See, that would be the sense. So when the deceased are referred to, you can use soul or spirit interchangeably in the New Testament, as I just showed you from those two passages. But you have to keep in mind the distinctions. So when you read it in the Greek, or if it's translated literally, like he saw the souls under the altar, then think of the soul as the person. Right away, nephish always think person. 
You'll be right most of the time. Sometimes it could be life, you see. And then when it's translated spirit, as in Hebrews 12, 23, then you think of the spiritual, immaterial part of the person. See, soul right away should give you a connotation after all these months and years of study of person. But if they speak of a deceased person as the spirits of just men made perfect, then the stress there is still the person, but it's the immaterial aspect of man. Because soul, while, of course, you're thinking if they're deceased of the immaterial aspect, nevertheless, you still always equate soul, person, person, soul. Spirit, all right away, you haven't removed yourself from thinking person, but you're thinking with the emphasis upon the immaterial or spiritual aspect of the person. You know, if people want to go through the Bible and try to make distinctions that are not there or try to find some where there are distinctions and try to make none out of them, you have to have all that background to know that what John was looking at, souls, what souls look like, how much do they weigh, color, so forth, size. But he saw the people. And John's a Hebrew. He didn't see souls. He didn't want King James translators to translate that souls. Come on now, you can stand to say amen sometimes, even if you are half afraid to. <laughs> After all this teaching, I recognize some who are just beginning in these studies wouldn't be able maybe to say amen, but John wasn't thinking of souls. He saw people. He saw the martyrs. <laughs> he didn't see a lot of souls in baskets and barrels and jars and containers. He saw in the spirit, you see, the people. And Paul's talking about the spirits of just men made perfect who are in heaven awaiting, you know, resurrection. He's talking about people again. He's not talking about spirits because over and over we've shown you, the word shows you, men are not spirits. Only God is spirit. Man has a spirit. As we taught you in Old Testament theology, once God gives you of spirit, then it can be spoken of as your spirit, man's spirit. But it comes from God. Then when he gives it to man, and that makes man soul, living soul, then the spirit is his and is spoken of as his. But you have to know all that to eliminate confusion. Remember, Jesus said, I'm not spirit after resurrection. He couldn't have said that as logos because he was spirit. But he wanted you to know now when he took on humanity, Hebrews 2, Hebrews 4, he remains humanity. God, man, but glorified in a new body. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. And so he clearly told his disciples, Handle me, feel me, see. A spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So his resurrected body was not spirit. They thought they saw a spirit on the water because they saw him walking. He said, It is I, be not afraid. I means me, nephish, ego. Ego, I me. Where he said, I, I am. That brings us to the implications of John 4.24, which is our text for this area of our study. The implication of John 4.24 for the Christian. Now, Jesus said, God is spirit. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Implying, if you don't, you're not worshiping God. You may think you are. You may have a three million dollar Episcopal cathedral or be a bishop of the Church of Rome. But in neither case, according to my Bible, are they worshiping God because they both have practically the same rituals. They worship God through ritual. Well, turn to John 4. I want to read several verses as a background for what we're going to say. This is the woman at the well. Verse 19, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now notice what she says. You have to get the background to understand why he stressed God's spirit, and if you worship him, you're going to worship him in accordance to his nature. She said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and they had a temple there, the Temple of Samaria, very elaborate, and ye say in Jerusalem. In other words, the Jews' temple is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me. I expect you to believe what he's going to say. The hour cometh 
when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is, from that moment, that is from the cross down to this day, the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. He's out looking for spiritual worshipers. And that's the basis for his next statement, God is spirit, not a spirit. That's not what he said. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the implications for the Christian from that passage, especially verse 24. Now clearly, clearly, clearly Jesus in this passage is drawing our attention to the fact that there's a link between God's nature, spirit, and the nature of our worship. There's a twofold implication in John 4.24 for the Christian. First of all, our conception of the nature of God will also affect the nature of our worship of God. Our conception of the nature of God will affect the nature of our worship of God. That's the first implication. In spite of the clear teaching of Jesus concerning the nature of God and the nature of our worship of God, man has attempted in every way he can to finitize the infinite God by attempting to depict him on canvas, carve him in stone for men to bow down to, or portray him on film by someone trying to impersonate the Son of God, or even God himself, like in the film, O oh God. I'll tell you, I don't want to digress, but there's some of the lower parts of the pit for people who try to portray God and make a joke and a comedy film out of it. But that'll have to take care of itself. We don't want to digress. But in spite of what Jesus clearly teaches about the nature of God, the nature of our worship, men try to finitize the infinite God that fills heaven and earth by carving him in stone, painting him on canvas, or by impersonating him on film, or through ritual worship. Now go back to the context of John 4, 19 to 24, and you'll see you cannot worship him by ritual. That's the whole significance of the Samaritan temple and the temple of Jerusalem passing away. He says it now has come to pass. No longer through ritual and sacrifice, liturgy. Of course, how do you answer that with the Catholic Mass, the sacrifice of Christ over and over, and all of the ritual and the Old Testament garb of the priesthood? There's not a lot of similarity, but that's where they get the idea. And the thousand and ten works that you do to maintain your salvation and the rituals you go through. Apparently, they've never read John 4. Now, when Jesus tells us in John 4 that God is spirit, he isn't supplying us, he isn't intending to supply you with some new information. Because the Jews certainly knew he was spirit. They, of all people, knew their God wasn't in stone, and they were conscious of the fact that he was spirit and dwelt in the Holy of Holies, and they couldn't see him. And the Samaritans, to whom he's addressing himself here, who were half-Jews, they knew God was spirit. And that only leaves the Gentiles, Jews, half-Jews, Gentiles, and according to Romans 1, even they knew that God was spirit before they perverted the revelation of that fact and made a creator out of the creature and worshipped idols. But Paul tells us, that even now, if they care to reflect a few moments on it, the Gentiles can know God is spirit. 
Now he speaks of the invisible deity there that they knew, you see, before they perverted the revelation, but he goes on to say they could still know it because that's going to be the basis of the judgment of the Gentiles. They don't have to see God. He says from the created order, chapter 2, from the conscience, they know there is an invisible deity. They know about the Godhead. So what I'm saying is that he isn't supplying us new information. Then what's he trying to tell us? All right, we'll give you about three things that he's saying here. In reminding the woman of the fact that God is spirit was the basis for his twice-repeated statement that since God is spirit, he has to be worshipped in a manner befitting his nature. Anything less is degrading. He has to be worshipped in a manner befitting his nature, spirit, not in some finite way, statues, pictures, whatever, crosses, and not in some ritualistic manner, as the Jews had come to do, as the Samaritans had come to do, as the Catholics came to do, and as most Protestants do. If you don't believe it, try to take their pictures and their little crosses away from them. Protestants I'm talking about, and you'll have a fight on your hands. More about that later because I've had that personal experience. So when he says God is spirit, he's saying he's not Material, he's not finite, he's infinite, invisible, immaterial being. And therefore, it is a sin to attempt either to worship or depict the infinite, invisible God by a picture of some finite sinner who posed for it, or by a statue that men bow down to, or by some created thing like a dove that charismatics call the Holy Spirit. Over in Deuteronomy 4, we've acquainted you with this passage before, but I want to read it again to remind you that while you could see maybe beyond so-called pictures of Jesus, that he even includes, though, the charismatic dove. Deuteronomy 4, 10 and following. When you came near to the mountain, verse 11, and the Lord spoke unto you out of the midst of the fire, you heard the voice of the words, but you saw no similitude. You only heard my voice, God said. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments, and I wrote them on two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you the statutes and the judgments, that you might do them in the land whither you go in to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed, whether you're old or New Testament saints, unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire lest, here's why, you corrupt yourselves and make you a statue, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that's in the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, and so on. That's going to include your charismatic dove. You see, the Holy Spirit, as we said last week, isn't a dove, and yet most charismatics, because that's all they see on their lapel pins, lockets around their neck, and on license plates, and all over the literature, is the dove. Then right away they think Holy Spirit, and that's blasphemous. He said, don't even make a figure relating it to God of a winged fowl, and all the other things, of course, man, woman, and they've got all sorts of men and women they bow down to. You wouldn't have to go past South Bend. Well, you wouldn't have to go to South Bend. You go right down almost any road and you'll find Mary in somebody's garden. <laughs> made out of chalk. Not even a good grade of concrete. But you see, the Holy Spirit, the only time he ever manifested himself in visible form because he's spirit. You can't see spirit. If you can see it, it isn't spirit. 
And so God, in order to tell John who the Messiah was, he says he will appear in the form of a dove. That was a temporary, one-time, once-for-all appearance to one man to tell him who Messiah was. Because Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. So the last person you want to pick out is Messiah, somebody you know that's related to you by marriage or whatever. You're going to be looking way off to the mountains or gazing in the direction of the sunset. So God had to show John in a special way. And because John received this one-time manifestation of the Spirit, that wasn't the Holy Spirit, that dove he saw, that's a manifestation of the Spirit in the form of a dove. How are you going to confine the Spirit that fills heaven and earth in a dove? Now, incarnation is something else, but we have only one incarnation where the God of the universe can confine himself in the womb of Mary, but you can't explain that. Don't try it. John, who saw the Spirit in the form of a dove, and the apostles who knew all about that, never once ever depict or speak of the Spirit as a dove, because they knew Deuteronomy 4. They're not going to idolize the dove or that temporary manifestation. That manifestation just disappeared, because the Spirit of God can appear as a man or however he wants. Well, don't try to do as people are doing. If anybody was going to do it, John should have started carving out, out of olive trees wooden doves to help this ministry along. He said, you know, <laughs> all of you faith partners now, if you don't have anything else, send me some locusts and wild honey. Because <laughs> at least I can eat. Which is what he ate for those of you who haven't been to Sunday school. We said, first of all, the reason that he says what he does in John 4.24, we must worship spirit in a manner befitting his nature. Then secondly, we're being told here in the plainest language possible that we are to worship the reality, not some man-made substitute or theological idea or doctrine, the reality. And anything less than the reality, we're told, won't be accepted by him. Oh, I know, there are probably people here who don't want really to face that fact, but how much worship do you suppose God has received down through the centuries? Well, before it's all over with, you're going to find out there are just some things right you heard through this pulpit, even though there may be strong and stern and kind of narrow things down to where, as one man said to Jesus, are only a few going to be saved the way you're preaching? That was a good question. He didn't bother to answer it. He just said, you strive with all of your heart to enter in because many will try and not make it. That's what he said. That kind of narrows it down. Straight and narrows the way. Few there be to find that. Broad is the way and many go into destruction through that. Now, I didn't write that. He said it. The Son of God himself, that they who worship the Father who is spirit must worship him in spirit. That does away with all of your liturgical worship. I don't care how emotional and pious and good it may make you feel or somebody feel to go through the ritual. He's looking for people who are not ashamed to bow down in the park on their knees or in the middle of the aisle of an airplane when it's trying to fall out of the sky. And just worship God. Call on God. So what he's saying, you are to worship the reality, spirit, not some substitute, picture, statue, doctrine, liturgy. Because, as we've said so many times, men will invariably transfer their affection to the substitute, to the finite object. If you don't believe that, reread Romans 1. That's the whole purpose in Romans 1. That's what they did. They transfer their affection, allegiance, and devotion to man-made objects are to created things. The sad part is Christians are being led to believe and in fact actually taught. You can find thousands of ministers who will disagree with what we're teaching tonight. So people are actually being taught that God will accept the kind of worship that God says he won't accept. They'll tell you it's through the ritual and so on. You've got millions of Catholics who'll tell you that. You've got millions of Baptists and Episcopalians that'll side in with that. So every Sunday we've got people violating the first and second commandments in Deuteronomy 4, which God says you're not to make any likeness, any image. Why does he forbid it? Because it's degrading. It's degrading. How can you take the pure, undefiled, infinite spirit 
that fills heaven and earth and localize it in some piece of clay or some buddy's paint. So the Old Testament forbids it in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 4. The New Testament forbids this degrading worship in John 4.24 and in Acts 17, 28, 29, and 30. We read those last week. So the New Testament forbids it. Paul says God is not something that you can confine in sculpture or by man's device and art, silver and gold and stone. So that's forbidding it. Everyone thinks of Catholics when you talk about bowing down before statues and your pictures and so forth, but they're not the only ones who need to be delivered from a spirit of idolatry because most of your Protestants get very emotional about that so-called picture of Jesus, the popular one, or the Last Supper painted by da Vinci, some statue, some religious thing they can wear or look at. And Luther himself, who was the father of Protestantism, did not get delivered completely of all of his Roman Catholicism when he got converted to Christ. And this is one of the places. And he said, and this is where Protestants, I guess, pick it up, if I can picture Christ in my heart, why can't I picture him on canvas? Well, that's human logic. But where in the New Testament are Christians told that they are to conjure up a vision of what they think Jesus looks like and then transfer it to canvas or to whatever. But Luther thought it was all right. Because if you try to depict the invisible God on canvas, now you don't know what Jesus looks like, so whether you're talking about the Holy Spirit, the Father, or Jesus, it would be all the same thing. If you try to depict the invisible God on a piece of canvas, invariably, it will be some idea of your own imagination, which makes it a lie because you don't know that that's what he looks like, and he doesn't anyway. Or you will conjure up some idea that you've seen somewhere, a picture, and you're going to call that God. So there's not a word in the New Testament or Old that I am permitted, as Luther says, because I can think of Christ in my heart, I can put that thought on canvas. See, I may be able to think of the invisible God, the sovereign God that fills heaven and earth, who at the same time is ruling on the throne in heaven. But there's no way I can transfer what's invisible to canvas or anything else. If I do, it's going to be vain imagination or something someone else imagined and put on canvas. He says, they that worship God must worship him in spirit. That is, from your heart, from your invisible spirit to the divine invisible spirit. Not through ritual, not through mumbo-jumbo forms, not even through some of these songs that people say, well, I can worship God listening to this or that. I know you can worship God in song. Now, let's don't digress on that. But I'm talking about that you can't substitute a song for your spirit worshiping God who is a spirit. Well, if you sing in tongues, we'll make an exception, won't we? They who worship God must worship from the heart and in truth. Well, start with the truth that he's giving you here, that God is spirit. You must worship him in an acceptable manner. Because any other form, and that's the third thing, any other form of worship is unacceptable to God. Because he said he's seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. A few things about the pictures that are supposed to be depicting deity. The story behind the Last Supper, I don't know if you've ever read it, and I suppose it's accurate, but are you aware that the same individual that da Vinci used, and he used models for all of them, all of the 12 apostles, including Judas, and a model for Christ, whom he's never seen, are you aware the same model, the same sinner, because... He went on to prove the model that he was a sinner, not even saved by grace, but the same model that he used to pose for Judas, he used for Christ. The story behind Da Vinci's Last Supper is that 
It took him seven years to paint that, not that it took him that long to find all the colors or put it all together because he was quite an artist, the artist of his day. But it took him that long to find someone to portray Judas that was degenerate looking enough to suit him. So he got all the models for each of the disciples, what he thought they should look like. He searched around to find someone that was clean cut enough to portray Jesus. Of course, he found a young man that looked clean. You know, there's some that don't look clean. They're just some you couldn't use. Well, of course, we've already mentioned that how are you going to find a sinner to portray the sinless Son of God? But he found someone that suited him, painted him in, but he couldn't find Judas. Took him seven years. And finally, in desperation, he visited the local prison. And of course, such a well-known artist, they let him try to find someone that would portray Judas. And he found a man in there that was the most degenerate thing he said he ever saw. Wasn't too old, but just corrupt, evil, degenerate. Asked if he could use him. Prison warden allowed him with guards to have him sit as the model. When he was done, painted in Judas, then he said to take the prisoner away. And he broke away from the guards and fell down before da Vinci and said, Don't you remember who I am? Well, he said, No, I've never seen you before in my life, before I saw you in the prison. He said, I'm the man that you used about seven years ago to pose for Jesus Christ. Now, the moral of that story is supposed to be it's all right to paint pictures when you don't know what Jesus looked like, but this is how what sin will do to a person, from a clean-cut person to a degenerate in just seven years, which the moral of the story is that, but that isn't our purpose. It shows that they're trying to portray the clean, spotless Lamb of God by using a sinner. And the same one that you look at in that picture that portrayed the sinless Son of God is also Judas. I mean, he didn't even see his inconsistency. What he should have done is torn it up. He should have never started to paint it. Now, it's significant there's not one description of the Son of God in the New Testament. That's where I'm going to pick up next time because you got enough in your basket. Don't you think if we needed these aids to worship, as they say, oh, it's an aid to worship, don't you think if we needed those things and they saw him and his humanity and his glorified state, they give us one clue to what he looked like? They don't give us a one. So that's significant, and that's where we'll start next time.